Natasha Vidamore, PhD, is an American designer and theorist. She's co-editor and author of the Transhumanist Reader, Classical and Contemporary Essays on the Science, Technology, and Philosophy of the Human Future. And she's also the author of Primo Post Posthuman, which is a pioneering future whole body prototype. She's a professor at the University of Advancing Technology, a fellow at the Institute of Ethics and Emerging Technologies, and she's chairman of the board at Humanity Plus. Now, for listeners of the podcast who haven't come across this sort of thing before, it's pretty remarkable. Humanity Plus is the magazine and sort of the institute around the transhumanism movement. The transhumanist movement is something we're going to talk about today, and I'm actually going to ask Natasha in my first question what it is, and it's something I've been following for, oh, good God, nearly a decade now. So, Natasha, please tell us what this is, and welcome to the show. I'm so excited, and I think a lot of our readers or listeners have never heard of transhumanism, so you're going to be breaking new ground here. Oh, superb. Great. <laughs> I love it. As long as I don't make a sinkhole. <laughs> uh, you won't do that. Transhumanism is a worldview that started actually as a codified philosophy in the early 1990s when Dr. Max Moore wrote the philosophy. But it stems from a broad range of perspectives about human evolution, the human condition, ethics about human enhancement, uh, looking at the emerging and speculative technologies that are intervening with biology and extending our lives and also making our lives um, more wonderful, more joyous, more um, focused, uh, our consciousness more aware, our intellection smarter, our health basically is the primary aspect of it, to bring about better health and understanding. Uh, the term transhuman means a transhuman in transition. So the human biology, as far as a transhuman is concerned, would mean that the merging with technology more and more. It differs from the concept of the cyborg in that the cyborg is a machine augmentation to the human biology uh, developed by Manfred Klein and Nathan Klein back in the days of cybernetics when we were thinking about going out into space, knowing that our biology just could not exist in space due to solar rays and uh, zero G on the bone structure of the body. However, the transhuman is steering its own evolution, so it's a totally different concept. It's about the human in becoming um, something other than solely or totally biological. It's a self-directed evolution. Um, a movement that your readers or your listeners, I should say, will know a lot about is Quantified Self, which was developed by Kevin Kelly, the, um, the brain um, person behind Wired Magazine. Quantified Self is about technology and humans, and uh, people come together at meetups all over the world and talk about taking responsibility for their lives. That is extremely transhumanist in scope, so I hope that narrows it down to the issue of self-responsibility. We're alive now, let's protect it and let's see how long we can live. So if I was to translate that, you were born inside a science fiction novel and you never came out of it? Like, <laughs> how much of this is... <laughs> Interestingly enough, I have hardly read science fiction. Really? Uh, that shocks me. I, 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 by the way, I love everything you were just saying, uh, but I know for a lot of people who are driving, listening to this right now, that their eyes could be crossing already. So what you're saying, if I was to try and play it back to you in one sentence, is that the human evolution itself of the biological organism is something that we should take control of versus something we should just replace, which would be the idea of, you know, becoming a cyborg. I think so. Okay. Now, of course, with the transhuman concept, as far as human enhancement is concerned, we are replacing body parts. More people walk around today with transplants and implants and prosthetic limbs. And we're going to be seeing more and more of that happening and refined, being designed by um, basically engineers with an aesthetic sensibility so that it will be personalized prosthetics. So again, the cyborg is just augmenting the body with machines. The transhuman is a self-directed evolution. Uh, to remain solely biological, we really can't extend the human lifespan unless we um, intervene with genetic engineering, isolating what causes aging and reversing it or you know, stopping it to the largest degree. But the bottom line is our biology is extremely fragile. And no matter how much we exercise or eat healthy food and meditate, live a joyous, healthy life, surround ourselves with positive people, we still can get disease. And um, if we have injury, if we're in a car accident, for example, 
um, we suffer and possibly die. So the issue here is how do we prevent this onslaught of death so early in our lifespans? Um, you think about it, 122 years is not that long to be alive in one life, in you know, one existence. So we'd like to push that a little bit further and um, create um, healthier lives for a longer period of time. In a nutshell, that's it. <laughs> The work that I've been doing for the past decade or so at the Silicon Valley Health Institute is all around anti-aging. And it's very much, how do we push our existing hardware, the, the body, as far as it'll go? And I appreciate the work you're doing, just saying, well, all right, it's only going to go so far. And what do we do after that? Which is obviously the next step in anti-aging. But what do you think that the human body is going to look like in just 10 years? How fast is this going to happen to us? You know, we always think things happen faster than they do, and, and there are many futurists who make predictions. I'm not one who does that. I, I am more of a theoretician and a designer, so I, I look at what's possible. I look at the world as far as systems thinking, much like Buckminster Fuller, yeah. um, and looking at what works together, where the variables are, what we can do now to help self-direct um, possible scenarios and there's not just one future there is multiple options for futures and it all depends on the decisions we make about our lives um, as individuals and society but if we take a look at where we would be 10 years from now certainly the trends show that we'll be enhancing the body more and more with um, devices that are external a smartphone and android and ios applications that we download um, perpetually, communication that is 24-7 and, and all the different social media formats that we have. But I think more importantly than that aspect of it is learning about our DNA. There is an organization called 23andMe where we can have our DNA um, identified uh, for, I think it's $99 still. I had mine done I think a year and a half ago or two years ago, I'm not sure. But um, we can find out what diseases we have a propensity for based on our genetic makeup. So that's something important to know so we can start living our lives with an awareness of that. Other things we can do, of course, as, as you know, and you're an advocate of this, exercise. I spend five to seven days a week in the gym, um, but I also relax a lot and party a lot, so it's, it's got to be fun. Um, I eat healthy. I have a semi-paleo diet. Um, I like your idea for your, your morning coffee. I haven't tried it yet, but I'm really looking forward to doing it. I'm going to try it probably, hopefully, tomorrow. I, I know uh, that the beans are at the Singularity Institute. There's a lot of people there who are into Bulletproof Coffee, so well, if you want it back, we'll send them to you. Uh, the Singularity Institute is no longer in existence. Oh, sorry. I used the wrong name. What's it called now? It's Singularity University. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, no, that's a big difference. Yeah, you're um, right. I'm an advisor to the, um, a track, the ethics track, the Singularity University, and I hope to be there in August for their um, events. Um, but yeah, I, I, I like the idea of this coffee that we put butter in that, that does provide some level of protein. And the issue here is getting healthy food, uh, preparing our food in a healthy way, and mastication. Not masturbation, <laughs> mastication. <laughs> yeah. So when you eat your food, make sure that you you know take time to chew it so that the um, your saliva can get the elements out of the food, the nutritious elements, and help your digestive tract absorb them. Otherwise, you're just putting food in, goes in one end, out the other. We have to make sure the food is healthy and we take our time eating it. Um, other practices for life extension, of course, I believe very strongly in Transcendental Meditation. I've been doing it since I was 18 years old. Yoga, I studied uh, yoga with Bikram uh, in Los Angeles, I mean in Beverly Hills, I should say, for three and a half years at his studio with Bikram. And you know Bikram Yoga has become major. It's uh, very difficult. It's more like gymnastics um, than, um, you know, spiritual yoga. But these are things that we can be doing on a daily basis. Um, the issue that you mentioned about where are we going in the future, what is the body going to become, the body is going to become more of a, a self-directed, self-responsible vehicle for our existence, for our consciousness and awareness, of course. Um, I think that we're going to be looking more deeply inside the body and identifying diseases earlier. I think that's one of the major trends in identifying um, our lifespan and, and our health level, level. being aware 
Um, we have apps on our, our smartphones. We need apps inside our body that are communicating with our brain and telling us what's going wrong if there is a, a certain illness coming up or our cells um, may be mutating in disadvantageous ways. Um, when we're fertile, when we're going through different moods of maybe depression or anxiety. So we need to be more aware of our body, this vehicle that our awareness is located in. My own work with Prima Post Human, which has now become a platform diverse bodies and autonomous uh, bodies, uh, is to look at building whole body prosthetics as an alternative to our biology so that we could have semi-biological systems that are largely technologically driven um, but do have major sensorial awareness and all the feelings and emotions that we have within our biological system. So it has to mirror that in large part. But the direction that we're really heading is to have whole body prosthetics because our biology just is not good enough. And um, again, we see more and more people walking around with you know, artificial hips, uh, veneer teeth, <laughs> different limbs. And it's not something we desire to be sure. It's something that we have to replace in order to stay alive and active. That's a really important point and one I wanted to drill in on because by now some people listening are probably thinking, well, that sounds unappealing, you know, put my brain in a toaster oven and then the toaster oven is my body is kind of the, the downside image of that. But you're saying it's better than dying. You're not saying it's better than whatever you have now. Well, I, yeah, I'm, yeah, it's better than dying. I'm sure yeah. someone who is in a wheelchair and I have many friends who are paralyzed in wheelchairs, would rather be alive in their wheelchair than dead. Uh, I think that Stephen Hawkins, um, uh, the uh, exemplar scientist, is happy to be alive even though he has ALS and it's, you know, it's pretty bad. He can only communicate through an artificial voice, a computerized mm -hmm. uh, dictation. So, you know, who are we to say when someone ought to die just because they lose a limb or have a, you know, a very difficult an untimely disease. So people want to stay al alive as long as they possibly can, as long as they have a hope for life or a desire to produce or, you know, feel loved or you know, want yeah. to give love. Uh, those are our human natural instincts that we need to um, protect. Uh, but I think that um, a whole body prosthetic could possibly be and let's use the term better, because that's the term you use, could be better than biology, in that it could be more durable, more flexible, more sustainable, longer lasting, less trouble, uh, less disease, um, not so many um, issues with having, you know, to constantly be monitoring our bodies, our temperature, our viruses, bacteria that infiltrate our body. Now, I want to make a caveat here. It's true that our computers get viruses and we're constantly having to protect our computers. So it's very obvious to me that if we did have a whole body prosthetic that was uh, technologically driven, um, that mirrors our biological system in large part, that we would have to have uh, very smart hacking systems um, to make sure that we are responsible for our bodies, that we would know how to hack it ourselves and also be aware of who else might hack it so we become experts in protecting ourselves. But I think that's the wave of the future no matter if we're a biological species or a semi-biological species or, you know, a um, post-human species that we will, we will and we need to become more responsible about our own lives and you know, cherishing and protecting and nurturing our lives. It, it's a really interesting trade-off. If you look at the environmental effects of eating, just the system's impact of that, it's enormous. Like we've basically done some pretty amazing things to the soil, not necessarily good amazing things, to the soil on the planet, and we spend so much energy gathering food. And if you were solar-powered and you had essentially a non-biological body, you could do some very, very different things that would be less impactful than what you're doing now. It, it's kind of like, you know, way beyond uh, the, you know, the, I ate everything local to, I didn't eat anything, and I changed my, you know, my power pack every five years, and I recycled the one I changed out. Like, it, it's, it's incredibly futuristic, though. It, it sounds like something that might happen in a thousand years, but there's the rate of technology change, and I know, as a futurist, that it's really hard to say, well, when's it going to happen? And you've got guys like Ray Kurzweil who will say, 2087 is when the singularity happens. <laughs> uh, but, like, it, there's so many things that need to happen here, and there's so much strife on the planet. You've got, you know, people starving and wars and uh, major issues around just getting enough food into people. Do you 
I mean, if you were to lay odds as a futurist as to how likely is the vision that you're painting here to happen at all, and how likely is it to happen within 50 years? What are your percentage of odds that, that you'd lay down on that? Uh, it depends on specifically what we're referring to. If it is life extension and living beyond the human biological limitation of, a, say, approximately 122 years, or is it whole body prosthetics? Which, uh, whole, which whole body prosthetics. I think we've got the 120 years in the bag. Like That's, that's going to yeah. happen before I'm 120. I'm, I'm actually not so worried about it, if you have enough money. <laughs> yeah, and then the and then you know in our society we drive the price down, and that's something that we do, and it's it's a proven fact. So um, the have-nots will be the haves. So I, I think that eventually, and 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 the gap in in the prices coming down gets shorter and shorter mm -hmm. all the time. So I think there'll be a fair amount of abundance for everyone um, as long as um, there are no heavy regulations and restrictions by bullies, you know, whatever card they're carrying, you know. Anyway, so I think that what we want to do is make everything available to everyone. No one should be left behind in, in any scenario about the future. So now let me ask, answer your question. There has to be a level of understanding about scientific and technological advancement. In order to have a whole body prosthetic, you have to have a person, and personhood is the philosophical term for a continuation of identity over time. You are who you were yesterday, we're here right now, okay, that's me again now. Another second, this is me again now. So, and tomorrow I'll be me then. So, it's this continuity of our identity which forms personhood. So, that's who we are and we can change certainly our nature, our behaviors, our values, whatnot over time, but we still continue because our who we are now is based on our memories and our experiences of who we were a moment ago. So in that regard, the continuation of personhood, well, then we would say, who is person? Where is it located? Well, for many of us who look at life extension, we consider, or I'll, I should just speak for myself, I consider personhood to be located in the brain. Now, if the brain is where our cognitive properties are located and our thinking um, apparatus take, um, take action and our awareness is designated, including our memories and our emotions and our feedback, then in the brain is what we would call the um, the location or the environment of personhood. It's who we are. So within that environment too we have something called consciousness perception awareness whatever term one wants to use our mind and we still don't know exactly what consciousness is that people have been studying it for for eons and and very brilliant uh, minds have been studying it and there's still no definitive answer to it but let's just suppose if mind is located with personhood in the brain somehow including outside um, systems that we cannot identify because we have limited perceptions just as giving a, a, a slight open window or door to that opportunity or possibility. With all this in mind, then it seems to me the most important issue here is to back up the brain because you just can't have a whole body prosthetic without a person in it. So we would need first, before we have whole body prosthetics as an alternative to a to a biological body or in addition to a biological body, we need to back up the brain. There is a lot of research and study being done in neuroscience and cognitive science and computer science about this, including psychology and design and a number of different fields. Ethics is deeply involved in it. So we don't have the hardware yet, but if we look at slicing the brain and identifying those neurological systems, the neural network, and understanding the synapses of the uh, dendrites and um, uh, axons and neurons and every bit of information that goes on, which is like a forest of complexity. Once we can copy that or transport, then we can have the body prosthetics, but not until then. Are you at all concerned that when you copy that, you're going to find out consciousness isn't just in the brain? I... Would I be surprised or alarmed? Exactly. No. Like, like, how certain are you that consciousness is in the brain? Because you just said we don't really know the definition of consciousness, but you feel like it's in the brain. My work tells me that there's a gut brain, there's a heart brain, there's probably some distributed nervous system intelligence, and then there's a thinking prefrontal cortex, and there's a midbrain, and there's probably some parts of the brain that you don't need if you don't have a body. But... Like, I would hesitate to say my consciousness is only in my brain because, A, I don't know what consciousness is, and B, it looks like there's some stuff that happens outside the brain that has a profound effect. Like, it's a big gamble for all the things you're saying. 
I didn't say consciousness is located in the brain. Let me let oh, me go back a second. I, mean, I was talking about personhood uh, and okay. that uh, the continu continu continuity of identity, of uh, the diachronic self, is who we are moment to moment to moment. So we need that continuity to form personhood. So if that personhood is based on our memories, our emotions, our perceptions, our awareness, yeah. and all we know at this moment is those are located in certain lo uh, areas of the brain that we can identify through watching neurological processes when you know someone's with um, heavy-duty scanning, you know, really smart technology, and also dyeing neurons and taking a look at the spikes and whatnot. So we know that there's a lot of activity in the brain as an electrical circuit. I also said we don't know what consciousness is, but let's just say for the, the time being, if we know that personhood is located somewhere in the brain because of memory and perception and, and thinking and cognitive abilities, intelligence, and creativity, then that's what we've got, so we need to back that up. I also yeah. said I, would, I wanted to leave a door open or a window open that outside the brain there are elements uh, in the universe, in our surrounding, that we cannot see, hear, perceive because we have limited sensorial makeup where, for example, my dog can smell things I can't smell, and it's amazing, or the cat can hear things I can't mm -hmm. hear. You know, there is all sorts of um, a variety of really amazing um, senses other animals and ins insects have that we don't have. So, And we also know that we can't see all the light rays from the sun. We can only see a certain spectrum. So there is a possibility that there's something around us that we can't see. Um, I agree with you in great detail about the... Um, the uh, I would call it the connective consciousness or the connectome around us. You know, Sebastian Siong talks about the connectome in the body, the brain, and the central nervous system, and every part of us being connected. Well, of course, that's that makes sense. We couldn't exist without that. But if we look at the larger um, picture here on a more gestalt platform, we are all buzzing around together. And I think that's one of the, the most interesting metaphors of the Internet. I mean, it's made us almost see that we're, you know, these the, uh, data systems communicating constantly with each other and sometimes a little bit too much, too many tweets that we don't want to see or <laughs> listen to. You know, some people should just stop tweeting. But, yeah, I agree with you that there's different levels of consciousness in fact, there's a consciousness conference every year at Arizona, uh, University of Arizona, and I'll be um, going to it um, next year, so uh, that's exciting. But it's a topic that we could talk about forever, and we'll find ways that we agree and ways that we don't agree. And a lot of it is driven by a person's instincts, by a person's value system, uh, morals, and also religion. Yeah. Uh, political views so you know everyone has a somewhat different perception on it so it's a tough nut to crack one of the concerns that i have is that there's a a remarkably cool study looking at heart rate variability and when a person walks into a stall of a horse that's trained to ride the horse's heart rate variability will within seconds change to match the heart rate variability of the rider without touch so this is probably in the EM spectrum. In fact, that's what the guys who discovered this are theorizing. And it's something that you can replicate. And that's why people who are afraid of horses generally get thrown off horses and people who are calm on a horse can ride it. Now, if the horse is a wild horse, it doesn't work. But the process of taming the horse does that. Now, if I put on my robot body <laughs> you know, with my, my brain either uploaded or just my brain in it, I wonder if we would lose that kind of connection. And I also believe based on some other data quantified self-style data around the idea that my heart rate variability will affect yours if we're in the same room together it's it's a subtle effect but it's a little bit spooky because i feel like there's a whole bunch of data we haven't gathered yet around human interaction on spectrums that are hard for us to see with our eyes or to detect with relatively primitive instruments so until we map out that interaction i'm hesitant to you know upgrade parts of my body and i i wonder if some of you know, Cheney's great evil, or is it Rumsfeld, uh, comes from the fact that, you know, he's got an artificial heart that doesn't even have a heartbeat. You know, it's a constant pump sort of thing. I don't know. But I feel like there's there's stuff going on in in here that affects what's going on up here. And we've got data about the number of nerves going each way and all that. 
So this is a slippery slope, and I wouldn't want to do something that would make me less human, but I certainly would want to upgrade the systems of my body to every extent they can, and I want to see every spectrum of you know infrared and x-ray with my, these eyes or some other eye, and I'm happy to mount it here or here. <laughs> so it's a very interesting uh, uh, future to imagine, but I'm not sure that we have enough data about where we are today in order to map that future out effectively. Do you have any thoughts on where research yes. should go over the next 10 years in order for us to know more about the body in order to be able to upgrade it? Sure, but I'd like to make just a, a quick comment on what you were saying. You know, it's interesting, when I lived in Telluride, Colorado, which is a ski resort 8,750 feet in the mountains, su surrounded on three sides by 14-foot mountains, I lived there for many years. And I had a different sensorial perception that I had than I had when I moved to Los Angeles when I had left Telluride, um, closed down my businesses and everything, uh, so I could work in the film industry in LA. And um, it was very ab ab abrasive to my system. The I felt I was in a river of metal, and the constant sound of cars and metal uh, was very unnerving to me. Uh, so it was something I had to work on on a daily basis so it wouldn't affect my physiology. Um, so the environments we surround ourselves in do affect us. The people we surround ourselves with do affect us. If we're with people that are negative or hostile or trying to hurt you, you will be pretty unhappy and uncomfortable if you have any level of perception or intuition. Uh, likewise, if you're around people who are joyous and enjoy your company and, and, and are very positive, it'll, you know, wear off on you. So it's always play tennis with someone who's better than you, um, as my father used to say. Um, now about horses and animals, I think that, that there is something there about um, getting in sync with other life forms. I certainly feel that way about my, my gardens, my roses, um, and my plantings. I feel that way about aesthetics in an environment very much um, as far as design and color and shape and form and sound means a lot to me too. I can walk in a room and, and pick up on a certain angular sharpness um, that makes me uncomfortable and I'll walk out of the room and just leave because I don't think it's healthy. So. Um, and many people are like that. We're very sensitive. We're very, uh, you know, in, uh, or maybe even a little bit too much to the environment. Other people don't even notice a thing. So um, by that, what I'm saying is each person has a different physiology, even though we're one species. We all are different based on so many variables, upbringing, you know, uh, learning, aptitude, uh, any, any a variable that even from early childhood to latest situation of a near-death experience or a, a loss of a love or a divorce or you know, job, career, difficulty can affect us in so many different ways. The issue about a whole body prosthetic is that we wouldn't want one in this time, in linear time, in the biosphere that didn't mirror biology. As far as being in a non-linear uh, time space, like um, in a cybernetic system, for example, the cybersphere, we would not need the same type of body that we would need in this environment. We need a different set of sensorial capabilities. So to exist in this biosphere that we're in, and in this biological landscape, a whole body prosthetic would necessarily need similar and advanced um, capabilities in biology, or we simply would be extremely uncomfortable. That is awesome thinking. So yeah, if we're going to go into space and live on a spaceship for 10 generations, <laughs> you need a different body. Uh, yeah, I, amen, <laughs> amen to that. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be this bag of meat floating in space for a long time. That's just bad news. <laughs> it's probably bad for the space environment too. It leaves little bits of humans everywhere. Yuck. <laughs> oh, well said. <laughs> So let's zoom in from the far future, which is fascinating. I love this. And talk about some things that I know that listeners are, are going to want to know, being that you're a transhumanist. Do you take supplements? Oh, yes, I do. But I, I'm not someone who downs them. I don't, I don't think it's healthy for the body to stuff supplements in your mouth, mainly because it puts too much pressure on our digestive system. Um, I take the supplements that I, I believe I need 
uh, vitamin D because I don't go out in the sun anymore because I had skin cancer. So I only run through the sun. So I need the vitamin D. Uh, fish oil, I think, because when you're aging, you lose collagen and elasticity in your skin and you uh, your nails become more brittle and your hair becomes more coarse. So that helps lubricate the body. Uh, vitamin C is always good, but I prefer it from uh, fruits rather than taking vitamin C. I take hormone replacement therapy, and I have since my late 40s. Um, I truly think it's one of the smartest things women can do, but I think it has to be bioidentical transdermal, which means uh, transdermal on the skin. Uh, estradiol, uh, you can have a little testosterone in there or not, but we've uh, found out that testosterone can cause hair loss in women as well as men so you might want to steer clear of that testosterone it produces with the body it produces a hormone on the scalp which causes um hair damage DHC, okay. right? yeah exactly exactly thank you um and then i take um let's see what else i uh, well that's about it basically i'm i'm pretty much a purist in that sense i'm someone who likes to get out and hike and, and, you know, do sports and uh, be in the environment, working in the garden. And, and I'm, I'm pretty much a naturalist in that sense. Um, as far as um, intervening with aging, of course, cosmetic surgery is very important, but not to do major facelift, you know, all this augmentation that, that so many people do, puffing up the lips and, you know, uh, Madonna face. You don't want to have this, this rubbery plastic face. I think wrinkles and lines are beautiful and, you know, just... Keep healthy. Uh, that's the main thing. Whitening the teeth is, I think, really important. <laughs> that's one of the first signs of aging. And um, so, yeah, be healthy and and teeth and uh, you know, fresh and smell good and all that kind of stuff. But um, as far as supplements, I did when I was uh, doing a lot of um, working at the gym with muscles. I I lost. 10 pounds of muscle mass, I believe, or maybe eight pounds, because I don't work out as hard as I used to. I just it's too much effort. But um, I used to take some, you know, never not steroids, but a certain um, creatine to help um, with the ACT and building muscle. I don't do that now, but I do do the protein drinks before going to the gym, and I still work out a lot and I have muscles, but not to the level I used to. I don't think it's so necessary. There are some interesting studies that show for people over 30, creatine increases IQ. Do you do other things to increase your intelligence versus just take supplements and be healthy? Yes, I do. In fact, that's something I've devoted the past uh, eight years to. Uh, I tried doing the crossword puzzles. I'm lousy at them. I watched, um, you know, different TV shows like Jeopardy and all that. I'm not good at that either. Um, dancing is great because you're crossing over the body. Yeah. It's very good for uh, helping increase the plasticity of the brain. So dancing is fabulous. Yoga is fabulous. Um, and what I truly support more than anything is going back to school learning a new skill um, so I've pretty much worked in that area because you if you stay in your own field it doesn't really help I mean it you know it's it's like a padding it's almost like a placebo but you, if you go in an area that you have no uh, cognitive skills in then you really are, are working those um, the plasticity and building new neural pathways so I, I think that's really important to do uh, yeah um, Another thing is uh, humor. You know, comedians are really brilliant, you know, and, and good comedians. Uh, so I think humor Both and, of them? and no. <laughs> right, exactly. Metaphors, symbols, yeah. <laughs> yeah you're, you're very funny. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I say that I'm just kidding. Uh, Joe Rogan's become a, a friend who's a, a famous comedian, and he's uh, he's an awesome guy who thinks really deep thoughts too. And, and I agree with you. Actually, comedians are incredibly valuable people who think about the world differently. And uh, I'm, oh. I'm happy to know uh, to know a few of them now, and and to go, wow, these guys are super cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, let's talk sleep. So. You know, do androids dream? It was the name of a science fiction novel, I believe. And, and now, do you reduce your sleep because when you're sleeping, you're not alive? No, I love sleep. <laughs> I love it. One of my favorite things is to have clean sheets. I only use white sheets and white towels. I love clean sheets and to climb in the bed. And I feel so comfortable in those clean sheets and to go to sleep. I love it. I just love sleeping. I love dreaming. I usually have good ones. Sometimes I have strange dreams, but usually they're they're quite good. Uh, 
I don't, I'm not someone who wants to lengthen my life by <laughs> knocking myself out, staying up. <laughs> um, but I, my creativity comes in waves. I'm a morning person, so I love getting up in the morning and getting work done, but I'm also a night person, so that's the, that's the tension, the struggle I constantly have to wrestle with. Um, so how many but, hours of sleep per night do you normally get? I'm pretty basic. I get usual eight hours sleep. Eight hours, very cool. I, I'm mm -hmm. starting to ask that question of guests on the show. I've done a oh, lot of sleep hacking to improve the the quality of my sleep so I can get the same amount of rest and recovery in less time because I feel like if I can free up three hours a day without incurring a biological or cognitive or creativity cost, it's totally okay. a good investment. But it definitely, you know, there you can burn yourself out that way. So it's always interesting to ask people with unusual minds like yours what their practice around sleep is. So thank you for Well, do you that. take naps? Do you take naps? Not usually. I, I've gotten my brain to the state where I, I can just go all day and and I feel good and I'm turned on and sometimes I'll you know, I'll have meetings where I'm talking the entire meeting for eight or ten hours straight after landing in the morning and I can do it and I'm okay. And and so I believe there's a certain amount of training in the nervous system that comes and I've talked with soldiers who improve their sleep dramatically and sleep experts who talk about, yeah, you can train yourself to have efficient sleep. So it's just interesting because it's a transhuman idea to be able to control and to select how much sleep you'd like to be able to get and to perform at the level you choose regardless of that. And so it's, it's really interesting to hear your take as you know, one of the leaders in transhumanism. And, and I like your answer perfectly well. That it's not a good or a bad thing to sleep more or less. It's just, you know, how, in, how much. Whatever makes you feel good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and I love sleeping. I know, love my dog being in the room or even on the bed. Uh, I need a blackout. I have blackout curtains in the bedroom. So important. Yes. Oh, yeah. it's so important. I, I have a sound soother on the bed and I, I love the sound of rain. Uh, it's just it's very calming for me, and I prefer it if my husband goes to sleep at the same time I do, but he likes to stay up and read. So we've recently just moved a, a, a very comfortable chair in the bedroom for him so he can read in the bedroom because I feel more comfortable. It's like family in the room. I want <laughs> everyone in there, and then I sleep more soundly. <laughs> That is so interesting to hear the, the perspective, like your specific perspective on that. I, I love it. Thank you. We, we, wow, that, that's such a great avenue for, for discussion because these are all, you know, you're a gardener. You, uh, you know, you connect well with your plants. I, I, you introduced me to your dog on Skype before we started <laughs> the recorder, right? So you, you've got this very warm sort of human side to you, yet some of what you talk about transhumanism is thought about at least in some camps as being the polar opposite of that do you what's do you what do you say to someone who says this is evil like you're removing the humanity from humans and things like that because my take on you is <laughs> you're not evil <laughs> you're curious and interesting <laughs> and you're doing really good thinking so like like what's how can there be this dark side of what you're talking about and the light side what do you say to those people i first i i try to be empathic. I, I try to understand what drives them to feel the way they do. And it's fundamental is we don't like change. Humans, by and large, don't like change. We like to find our little niche and then, you know, put all, like George Carlin said, put all of our stuff and we like to have all of our stuff there. And then this is my stuff and put our sign outside the door. You know, I'm, this is my religion. This is my politics. This is my family. This is who I am. You know, this is how I like to have relationships. This is my gender. Yeah. You know. Oh, like Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like we like to, <laughs> exactly. But in my, in my world, I'm a natural explorer. I've always been challenging the edge. Uh, I, never felt comfortable with one one set practice or one rule and, and and frankly i grew up in a time where you know there's a lot of misogyny and and i have three brothers and my parents you know and i love my parents and my mother is been one of my key supporters um my father passed away but growing up it was a man's world men went to university men were the doctors the lawyers the preacher and i remember um at church one day at 18 i just got up and walked out i thought i never want a man telling me what to do again what my moral compass should be i need to know for myself if i'm a, a valued person and then i started noticing in in universities uh, male professors competing with me and i would win awards and it was just so uncomfortable and it made me realize that there's this this identity issue of not just gender but racism, bigotry, um, this 
this type of world where you're supposed to be someone and that's who you are. So I'm a very strong supporter of human rights, multiplicity, and diversity. Uh, just from firsthand experience, um, the, um, a lot of the issues, too, that make me love the idea of human enhancement is when I was a teenager, I spent considerable time helping um, um, children in need, and, and I worked in the hospital, and I also worked in an area called Home for Incurables, where people were so physically deformed that they were not allowed in public. If you can believe that, it would it would be outlawed today, but it was a place called the Home for Incurables. And I would go do Christmas parties there and take take gifts, and, and it taught me early on that there's this broad spectrum of what a human is. There are people with, with massive deformities or mental illnesses, and they still deserve to be understood in whatever way they can. So I have a, I have a background in, uh, a broad background in a lot of experiences, and then my own personal experiences, of course, you know, you go through your trials and tribulations in life. Um, but when I talk to people and they, they come down and say, well, and, I, and it's happened to me many times, especially in Europe, you know, what are your ethics and you, you know, eugenics and you want to control the world? And I just, I listen. And then I, I try to say, well, how long do you want to live? You know, do, are you, do you want to have children? They go, yes. But well, do you want to see your children's children? Yes. Do you want to maybe have another career someday, something you really love? What do you love to do? Well, I'd love to be an attorney. I'd love to be a painter. Well, what if you had time to do that? And before you know it, most people are 150 years old. And they're happy talking about what they'd love to do. And if you talk to them about someone that they know that has um, a terrible disease or paralysis or an injury, and you ask them if you could help them and give them a you know, robotic arm or you know, go in and, and engineer their body so that this cancer could come out, would you do it? And one-on-one -on -one people say yes. So individually, we all want to be loved and love and share life and find peace of mind. You know, it's, it doesn't yeah. come easy. But as a society and a group, we become more bigoted and judgmental and I'm right, you're wrong. And, and that's in politics and it's in religion and it's in lots of groups. Um, so I, I, that stands out to me and I try to understand it. It's difficult, but I, I do my best. And I've had lots of years experience dealing with people when I'm on stage, um, you know, getting angry at me. And I've had to learn just to try, just listen and don't argue back. Just state my case and, and leave it at that. I did have a TV show in L.A. for I think about seven years called Trans Century Update on the Future in the 1980s, and I think I ended it in 1993. Um, and that was that that was great. It got me elected to the Green Party. <laughs> I ran on the Green Party ticket, if you can believe it. Anti technology, wow. <laughs> and I won the election in Santa Monica, um, you know, West LA. Um, I got the most votes, and I, I lasted for a year. My platform was we can use technology to solve some of the environmental problems, and and we definitely can. So, um, but moving forward, I, I just. I try to listen and it gets annoying, I have to tell you, and it gets frustrating when I'll emphasize ethics, I'll emphasize, you know, the, I'll emphasize even the flaws I see in transhumanism and my own views. And I still have people not even listening to a word I say and go, it's only for the rich or, um, you know, it's a selfish thing to do and what about overpopulation and, and, yeah, and I explain it over and over. So I think it just takes time and I think it's going to be more of a cultural shift, frankly, just like we've seen with quantified self. I think it is the quintessential example of people just doing a transhumanist act and not even aware of it. They're doing what is so fundamental to transhumanism, self-responsibility, being innovative and, and uh, the, um, developing an understanding of their lives, you know, it's, just, it's pretty just exciting. Ordering, ordering your own lab tests uh, because you <laughs> can, because you want the data, not because you think you might be sick. It, it's such a <laughs> thing that most people have never done. It, it's I know. Something for me, that's well, I guess going on, yeah, ten plus years I've been doing that, and I, I can't imagine not doing it any more than like changing the oil in my car. But it is very much a mindset thing. And I, you should, in my opinion, keep on doing what you're doing to get people thinking about this and where it leads because it's important and it'll go there anyway. If we don't think about it, we just won't like where it ends up. Yeah, yeah. We, we need to just keep on going. And um, I think that, there, of course, in every group, there is the extremists who you know, are a little bit forceful. We see it with the Republicans, the Democrats, the Christians, the Jews, the Muslims. Every group has. And we see it with the postmodernists. 
there's many postmodernists who are, you know, demonstrative about their postmodernist views. And I always say, what solutions do you have? Yes, you can counter the Enlightenment, modernism, you can get mad at, at uh, universal natural truths, you can get mad at all this stuff and help restructure it. And I like that, getting away with this strong scientism and universal norms. I think that's been very bad for humanity because it, it, it defies individuality and diversity. But on the other hand, when I say to postmodernists, what are you contributing? How are you helping the situation we're facing right now with some of the, the issues with people not having enough clean water or housing or the wars, for goodness sake, and the abuse to women? There's no answers. So um, I think transhumanism, at least, if it does anything good, um, besides being a proponent of life extension and healthy life um, for everyone, is that to break through um, people sitting on couches not doing anything. Um, transhumanists, by and large, are very proactive. They're doers. Um, so I think it's endemic, just like quantified selfers. They're doers. I mean, they're, you know, and, and the thing about quantified self that's so fabulous, you don't have to be a technologist. You don't have to be a programmer. You can write it in pencil and yep. it's okay. And I love that. I think that's a really generous of spirit. We're running out of time on this. Interview. So I'll hold up my book. <laughs> that was the question. There's two questions for you. Number one yeah. is actually the last question is normally how do we learn more about you? But hold up your book and give us a oh. URL. And this will be in our show notes as well. So, Can you see it? Yes, it's very readable. It says, The Transhumanist <laughs> Reader, Classical and Contemporary Essays on the Science, Technology, and Philosophy of the Human Future. And what's your URL? Um, mine is natasha.cc. Cool. Just www.natasha.cc. I am building a new uh, network. It's going to be the Transhumanist uh, knowledge and Media Center. It'll be separate from Humanity Plus and all other organizations. It's not going to be an organization. It's going to be a network, an information center. And it's going to be uh, based in large part on the book because there's so many fabulous thinkers in this book. It's an anthology. It's not a novel. Um, so have all that work there, all the ideas about transhumanism and life extension, human enhancement. I'd love to have your work included on it because it's so important. So I'm looking at... Um, becoming more of a knowledge base, a library of knowledge, and also a media center. So anyone who has any questions about transhumanism, human enhancement, life extension, etc., can go there. And what we want to do is connect people and make sure that people are connected at the level of their knowledge and experience and you know what the user wants, who can deliver for it, if we want to speak in that language. <laughs> Then wow, the that's, a, that's a big mission. Uh, that's exciting. Yeah. And I'd, I'd love to support it. Thank you. I'd love for you to. I think that you, you certainly provide um, a creative, intelligent um, level of comprehension about the future and the human as far as not just health and, and uh, physicality, but also um, questioning and, and pondering and um, opening an avenue to not be judgmental, to keep asking questions, and that's what we all have to do. So thank you. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. Thank you for the compliment. The final question, and this is something that every guest has always answered, is what are your top three recommendations for people? This doesn't have to be from your transhuman experience, just your, from your entire life lived. If someone wants to perform better, kick more ass, and live the ultimate life, what are the three most important things they should focus on from your experience? First, be honest with yourself and know where you excel and where you fall behind. And everyone's different. There is room enough for everyone. So just figure out where you do well and where you don't and, and just accept that. Uh, don't have to elbow other people out. There's plenty of room for everyone to have their own personality and, and career and mission. I think that's very important. Number two is surround yourself with people who admire you and value you and give that back to them. And number three is random acts of kindness and senseless acts of beauty, I think, is a way of life. It certainly is. Um, it's kind of like paying it forward. So those are my three recommendations. Thank you for sharing those. 
Natasha Vietamore, I really appreciate being on the show today. It's been awesome talking with you, and thanks for all the work you're doing. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> and of course, you know, as we all know, the key to getting better is dealing with your mistakes, is analyzing them, seeing what went wrong. So, for example, the feeling of stupid is really one of those things that sabotages students for years and sabotages people for a lot for life, you know. That's that's something that has no place in your in your personal worldview is the idea of stupid because that will really sabotage your progress.